Welcome to the Microsoft Azure Well Architect Framework. Uh, this is the performance efficiency session. So uh, after the series of sessions, this is this comes to as the last uh, pillar of the Well Architect Framework. Um, just uh, ask me any time during the presentation if you have, have any questions or something like that. So we can have a sort of a uh, conversation mode of uh, presentation here. So I'll start with um, where we are at the uh, framework. So uh, this well architected frameworks has uh, five pillars of uh, architecture excellence. Um, I bet most of you have been through the other sessions. So cost optimization, operational excellence, reliability and security has been already done. So this is the last one uh, apparently so the performance efficiency um in general uh, this talks about uh, the ability of a system to adapt to changes in load so uh, how do we make sure our application is uh, able to adapt to um, certain loads and certain dynamic loads and how it behaves under certain pressure something like that so um let's go in then so uh, here is the agenda so i'll be speaking a few words about uh, uh, overview uh, under the overview i will be speaking about uh, the few technical uh, keywords that we are going to use and uh, of course how it uh, happened early days and uh, what we are uh, what is the definition of uh, certain keywords and uh, the available uh, mechanisms to do uh, scale up and scaling things and of course then we will be move on to uh, application design uh, there we will be talking about um, common mistakes that we make and uh, the pitfalls that we might aware of and then under the capacity planning uh, we are going to talk about the boundaries of the resources and a bit about auto scaling and under the load testing we will be talking about things to consider when carrying out a load test and uh, the importance of it and how do we adjust based on its results something like that and um, of course the monitoring uh, the most important uh, part uh, importance of monitoring of your app matrices and things around so how do we monitor things and uh, take actions based on uh, those matrices and finally we'll be talking about um, sort of a summary of uh, checklist items that you need to go through uh, when you are pushing your system to production and uh, of course, we'll be talking about the case study as well. Okay, um, so let's go into the overview first. Um, so here is uh, two important terms that we need to uh, get sort of familiarized. The first thing is the performance efficiency, which means uh, by definition, it means the ability of a scaling workload to meet the demand. So uh, the scalability is ability of system to handle increased load. So these two terms will be uh, referring here and there so many times. So what we basically talk about uh, making a scalable, adaptable system. So you know most of the times uh, whatever the applications we developed uh, might not be scalable as we think because of uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say poor design patterns uh, because of the decisions that we made based on certain things so it happens so uh, let me uh, explain few few jargon into the uh, performance efficiency world so uh, here we talk about something called uh, scalability uh, we mainly talking about vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Uh, basically, vertical scaling means uh, you can increase the processing power of a given uh, 
web app or virtual machine or function app or something like that. So for example, uh, let's assume that you have a web app. You created the Nature environment and it has about uh, 3.5 gigs of RAM and uh, you can of course uh, the vertical scaling refers to uh, scale up and scale down. So you can scale up into uh, 7 gigs of RAM and also you can increase the capacity uh, on CPU processing power and memory. So you can also scale it down. So that's about the vertical scaling. And when we think of horizontal scaling, it's about increasing number of uh, units in terms of all. So the same thing we called as scale out and scale in. So when you're thinking of scale out a web app, you, it means you are increasing, increasing the number of instance. You are increasing the number of instance count and uh, uh, scaling in means you are decreasing the number of increasing count. So that's pretty much it. And uh, that's the today's cloud business. So I know most of you have familiarized with the uh, we told uh, on-prem server decks. So earlier days we had to, you know, uh, plan things early and buy necessary equipments and plug it in and, uh, you know, prepare for the worst. And uh, it's, it's all hardware based and we need to uh, request certain uh, downtimes and uh, uh, do the upgrades and face uh, certain issues like network bandwidth issues, hardware failures, even lightning strike has come to play. So things like that. Um, but nowadays we are not going to exp uh, experience such things. So it's a bit different, but we will have another set of problems, of course, to dealt with. Um, yeah, so let's go into some principles that we need to add here, I would say. So uh, some basic principles that uh, uh, we need to consider when we are talking about the scalable applications. First thing is a uh, uh, perform load testing to set limits. So load testing helps to ensure that your application can scale in out or maybe up and down like I explained earlier and do not disappear during peak traffic. Not only that, it helps to benchmark our application, for example, uh, without scaling taken into uh, stage, we can say like uh, this is the boundary of the application where we can perform well. For example, maybe 2000 concurrent users at given peak time, something like that. So uh, there's only one other thing. Uh, there's a limit to Azure resources as well. So they cannot indefinitely grow as uh, scale goes up. You, I mean, uh, you can't uh, uh, scale up oh, uh, the virtual machines indefinitely. There will be limits. So it's, it's good to have a look on uh, Azure service limits and managing limits uh, when you have time. So that's good uh, sort of a resource to take a look at. And of, of course, uh, understanding billing for metered resources as well. Sometimes business requirements will determine based on the trade-offs between cost and the level of performance uh, you can give out. So it doesn't mean that uh, you can like buy the most powerful server and put everything there and uh, just give it to the uh, production environment. So it will have some uh, incurring cost. So you have to consider that too. And uh, the most important thing is uh, Azure doesn't be directly bill on the resource cost. It, if it is a database, for example, it can be DTUs or maybe RUs, request units. So most of them are combined of a uh, combination of uh, computing power, bandwidth, and memory consumption and etc. So it it does not directly implies to the uh, like sort of a flat rate. It might be varied based on certain scenarios. Um, yeah, and uh, of course uh, monitor and optimize. So that's uh, another major thing that we need to take into the consideration. 
So uh, looking to the matrices would allow you to provision resources dynamically and scale with demand, or at least you can plan for what's coming in the future based on the matrices trends. You can uh, you can of course bring these logs and stuff into the Power BI and analyze the trends and identify any upcoming bottlenecks. And uh, the most important thing is uh, avoid anti patterns. So I have a couple of items listed down here. So we'll we'll discuss this in detail uh, in the upcoming slides. So I'll uh, go to the next turn and uh, yeah, the first. Uh, uh, so I I want to mention another thing. So if you encounter any issues, so like. Um, uh, questions you can uh, bug me at any time and uh, ask it. So the first thing and is the BC database. So this is a common anti pattern and uh, I guess most of you have seen it and uh, observe it, but uh, without knowing the definition because I have been through it uh, recently as well. So what happens here is basically uh, most of the times uh, if we are dealing with stored procedures and uh, some database views, something like that. So we tend to push the some part of business logic into the database tier or the persistent layer. So which means uh, you can see uh, the stored procedures are used to encapsulate business logic and uh, probably it might do some form for business logic calculation within the database. So the databases are not meant to uh, calculate complex operations. Of course, they can calculate uh, some optimized calculations so like summations, some some static uh, functions, but not the complex operations. So uh, how do you identify that? So I have taken like a couple of screenshots from our databases in Adra. So we mainly take a look at this uh, query performance insights and uh, take a look at how the uh, query executions, execution count and the time. So this is about uh, last 24 hours uh, qu query execution time in total. So if you do the math, it's around uh, 0 0.2 seconds per query. Uh, so this is a good uh, way to you can uh, pinpoint uh, some form of uh, resource eating or time taken query queries. So also it might uh, Asia might provide sort of a automatic tuning and you know it will suggest you a couple of indexes to be uh, created. But uh, it's it's always better to have a sort of a manual review on this because uh, when you are creating index, it's only pro particular environment. For example, you can't create index. Some some indexes you can't create uh, on the dev environment because it might not the same case in the production or stage. And uh, another good way to identify sort of a busy data pattern is uh, sudden spikes and into the hundred percent of DTU usage. So uh, right now uh, you can see this is about sixty percent of the DTU usage, but this might not be the case. You need to take a look into these uh, query patterns as well. So let's take about uh, the busy front end. And uh, another issue is uh, this is mostly most commonly found in uh, I would say desktop applications, but you can see this is in the uh, web apps as well, but uh, mostly we are going to uh, you know do sort of a background jobs within the same application space so for example um, you know uh, do sort of a recurring jobs and stuff based on uh, some client trigger something like that so it will uh, uh, that that can starve uh, the application uh, in running and runtime so decreasing response times and uh, stuff like that. So mainly this happens when an application is developed as a monolithic piece of code. 
so which means you can't separate it like uh, you can't separate the batch jobs you can't separate the file uploads you can't separate the image processing stuff and um, something like that it's all in one code base so the most common practice is to move the processes that consume significant resource to separate backend you can of course use Azure function apps to do some background jobs and some logic apps to do some uh, you know easily configurable stuff uh, for example sending mails and things like uh, talking to external services so the next thing is sort of a chatty io anti pattern so if you take a look at closely uh, there are a few uh, issues here um, it's actually creating a sort of a, the method is about get products in subcategories so it's actually requesting for subcategories uh, it's actually requ requesting for the products in particular subcategory id so here uh, if you see this uh, the i enumerable type is changing to sorry the i queryable type is changing to enumerable two times and uh, Within the for each loop, you actually create two list async. Um, we do not know exactly how many product subcategory items will be in this. So it's actually executing uh, the same query uh, about unknown number of times. So this means uh, you are making uh, some burst of requests within this method to uh, database. So one common thing you can do is uh, you can merge these things and uh, create one particular link query and execute it one times and get the results out. So some something like that because these these things are common in our code and uh, we tend to do things because if you look at the coding perspective, this is very descriptive, but in terms of execution, it is not very handy. And uh, one another thing is uh, external fetching anti pattern, which means uh, uh, fetching uh, the data more than needed for the business operation. For example, the first one you can see it needs to be uh, get the list of product IDs and name. Perhaps it's maybe bind into a drop down list or maybe some form of a search uh, box, but. Uh, First, uh, the coder tries to get all the products and uh, performs the two list operations. And then uh, he tries to do a select operation. So this part happens within the memory. So which means your application instance will uh, have a significant amount of memory allocated to this stuff because you don't know how many products in the production database. Perhaps this will works very fast in your development environment, but it's not scalable as you think. So uh, the second one is something similar. But um, if you see the see something here, this might related to the BC database as well. So by fixing external fetching, you might be creating a BC database as well. There's a possibility because um, right here, uh, this guy is uh, getting the uh, all the sales order amounts and submit within the memory. But of course, like I said, uh, the basic uh, stat operations, you can push it to the database because it's uh, optimized for that. So rather than doing this uh, in memory, you can push it to the uh, database with a link query and then uh, do the tool list or get the sum out of it. Um, yep so let's talk about um improper instantiation anti-pattern so this is something uh we would tend to do because you know the usings are pretty much good at uh, disposing the elements inside so we tend to create uh, objects as we need and uh, do the stuff and uh, things like that and uh, so but just uh, to be advised uh, especially the classes like http client q client and document client connection multiplexers things like that are not meant to be instantiated like this so those are meant to be created once and then shared across uh, 
sort of a scope so actually we we had a small case with this kind of approach uh, when we pushing some uh, log entries to endpoint so uh, we unintentionally created this sort of approach and it ended up with a huge memory leak because it actually allocating so much memory even though we are using sort of a using statement it will take about a uh, little time to dispose it um yep and uh, the monolithic persistent entity pattern and uh, we can call it one database to rule them all uh, we can use one single database to do our logging application logics uh, the application persistence and uh, files images uh, you name it everything is one in database so that's not going to uh, work well because if you are thinking of uh, scalability it might not be the good way uh, because uh, there might be certain parts uh, growing uh, than we thought so uh, it always good to have separate uh, databases so storage accounts like for files you can create blob storage and uh, based on the uh, nature of data you can of course uh, create sort of a hybrid approach like document dbs rdb mms and things like that for session you can of course go for edit database um and the last one from the anti patterns is no caching so uh, there are some instances that uh, you might request the same record again and again uh, from different clients different clients means different uh, users in the web space so repeatedly fetching the same data can reduce performance uh, because each time you have to go to the database and fetch the thing from the database so here you can of course uh, use some sort of uh, caching provider and uh, cache it on sort of external provider like redis cache uh, it's it's not good to use sort of a session state because uh, I'll be talking that with the affinity session affinity. Of course, you can uh, if it is a single uh, instance application. Of course, you can use in memory caching or session to you know uh, store this object. But uh, it's not good when we are talking about scalability. Um, so those are few anti patterns uh, to avoid. When we are talking about the uh, general application design. So any anything you want to know further or any questions up until now so I can uh, move on to the next one. So we can uh, discuss about then uh, jump into the designing scalable Lish applications. So we talk about overview and we talk about some common pitfalls that we might come across and of course uh, when it comes to the designing scalable Lish applications so some uh, common checklist to follow up we'll uh, talk about in detail one by one so first thing when we are talking about new application it's always uh, Back at the day, it, it was like there were no choice. You can go for RDBMS. It's about uh, the technology. You can go for DB2 or maybe MSSQL or maybe MySQL. So everything is sort of a relational database model. But nowadays you have a choice to make based on your data set. So some applications might have uh, select to go with RDBMS. So if so, you have past relational database services offered from Asia, like Asia SQL databases, MySQL, Postgre, or maybe MariaDB. And if you think of going for a like uh, document DB or sort of a NoSQL DB, some key value pair uh, or something like that. So there is Cosmos DB to try out and Asia Cache for Redis. So there are a 
couple of things and uh, also you might come in a scenarios like you cannot stick to one particular database uh, so it might be combination of a relational database like uh, hsql and use some some of uh, document db like cosmos db there may be some scenarios to use some sort of hybrid approach so that's uh, that's it from the database selection and uh, something about connection pooling so we talk about selecting database and of course the next thing is uh, connecting to the database so i i bet most of you are familiar with uh, registering the database context in the app startup so i'm i'm not going to open up any codes but uh, i just posted a little code here so uh, most of the times we add the database context without this pool part so which means we just uh, created the database context and uh, we let the framework to manage its instantiation most of the times it will be scoped so uh, it will carry out uh, the operations and dispose it but uh, when it comes to establishing database connections like if you are creating hundreds of connections uh, there might be uh, expense attached to it because it need to uh, go through the authenticated connection to the remote database server and uh, wait for the connection to open up and things like that so what is it uh, com what is com what comes with the connection pooling is uh, connection pools tries to uh, create the connection between server and uh, the application space and uh, tries to keep it uh, connected and uh, you can of course reuse these connections and uh, Based on the common practice, it is suggested to match the application trans concurrent number of concurrent transaction supported on each application is to the instance to the uh, number of uh, connections in the pool. But uh, honestly, I haven't tried that, but uh, that's good thing to try out if you are experiencing sort of uh, connection issues. Um, yep then and the most important part so data compressing so i guess most of the times uh, most of the bundling uh, packages are supported nowadays this thing so even back at the day uh, i guess uh, had something called dynamic compressing and static compressing so it tries to compress the stuff uh, pushing out to the web server to the client so um, it actually uh, helps to uh, reduce the network bandwidth utilizations as well so that's something to con consider when we are talking about scalable apps yep and the other thing is data locking so uh, i guess most of you are familiar familiarized with the acid properties so when it comes to the acid properties we tend to keep the atomicity and the consistency and the certain isolation level so let me quickly explain what is atomicity so let's assume that you have a sort of a transaction uh, let's assume uh, you reduce some uh, 20 rupees from a's account and add it to the b's account so this transaction should be uh, run on a uh, single uh, uh, atomic operation or uh, in other words it should not interleave with another transaction running on another thread so this should be run as a single atomic operation so which means it might be blocking both uh, tables at given time and uh, do the operation and commit it so if it fails at uh, let's say the last step uh, when it's trying to write the balance to b's account it should roll back if there is a failure it should roll back to the state where uh, it uh, tries to start so that's one form of a locking and uh, another thing is uh, sort of isolation so uh, let's assume that uh, there are two transactions coming 
to the same table, same row set, uh, T1 and T2. But the uh, the order of transaction should be uh, in particular order because T1 has to be executed prior to the T2. If T2 executed prior to the T1, uh, the things will be very uh, difficult to identify because uh, one is add operation, the other one is multiply operation. So the balance will get changed. So there should be sort of isolation uh, to run T1 first and T2 second. So you can actually see uh, what is the isolation level uh, of your database running few DBCC commands. So just uh, have a look on that when you have time. That's that's good read uh, uh, and that's good to know about uh, the database isolation levels and data how data locking happens because these settings can directly impact on your scalable applications. You know, um, we need to keep asset properties, but it, it has uh, some uh, cost of, uh, I would say cost of uh, scaling limitations. Uh, so it needs to be addressed as well. So wherever you want, don't need to use transactions. You do, you should not. So some some small operations that if you think you need not to use any transactions and it doesn't uh, happen, so you can omit it. Um. Yep. So the next thing is next common thing is the asynchronous programming. So uh, I guess this async keyword then uh, await is been there for a while now. Uh, so most of the times people wondering uh, so this is this is called some some code extracted from a web controller uh, so what is the purpose of uh, putting async here and uh, doing await here so it's anyway going to hold the result uh, coming results to this variable and uh, get the result out so it's basically uh, the same thing if we write uh, without await and async so one can argue, but uh, of course this won't be notified to the client whether you are putting async and await here uh, to the requesting client. But of course, if there is a second client who tries to connect to the same endpoint and uh, web server is running out of resources, there is a possibility that uh, until this guy get the string from this particular website, uh, website suspends this uh, method call and it will be freed up the carrying thread so that thread can attend to the another user's request in the meantime until this comes to the the server so there is a uh, chance that uh, the web server can serve another one another guy so always think of uh, using async and uh, wait keywords wherever possible. And uh, think of uh, parallel execution where possible. So uh, this is some code I extracted from our code base. So uh, this is related to some form for ETL jobs that we are doing. So uh, think of uh, processing uh, sort of a data in each table so you are putting some uh, data into each table. So here we do not have any uh, interdependencies between each tables in this particular table list. So what we are doing is we are processing all the tables within tasks and uh, it's doing parallelly. So uh, what degree of parallelism we don't know. That's up to the uh, environment to decide and think like for example, if you have 20 tables, we do not know whether 20 tables will be carried out uh, parallelly at once or maybe five at once. So it, it ups to the server to decide based on its thread pool availability. Um, the next thing is microservices, which is a common term these days. So it's a sort of a software engineering technique to uh, decompose isolated, loosely coupled and independently deployable modules. So uh, each of these can be versioned and deployed easily. So the 
the benefit of is of this is uh, you can scale it uh, based on the requirement for example if you have a massive application where uh, inventory sales marketing and everything goes together so you can uh, uh, scale only the sales part so you can give the based on the user load so you can just scale one particular part so most of the times these uh, comes with sort of a combination of orchestration platforms like kubernetes or maybe service fabric so with this you can uh, uh, tailor made uh, these pods and uh, make it right sized scale up and down based on uh, certain rules or maybe configure it to do a sort of a schedule something like that mm. The next thing uh, is queuing and batching requests. So you can, uh, of course, uh, think of creating a queue. Uh, if you have a endpoint which might uh, come some loads of requests and one at once, for example, you can get burst of requests to one particular endpoint at a given time. And if you, uh, that might be bottleneck based on the uh, uh, network bandwidth to the uh, persistent layer and maybe the cal uh, what we call the calculating power of the application instance. So everything like that. So you need not to worry about that if you use sort of a queue and you take the request into sort of a queue and then process it later on. So right here, uh, we have sort of example uh, few application instance trying to read or maybe write to the data store but certain things get time out because it's not available it can only serve at three people at once so if you implemented sort of a queue here of course it can uh, serve at its maximum pace for longer time but here uh, there's one trade-off uh, you cannot uh, give response as soon as uh, you submit a job, but you need to do some extra programming as well. So you need to trace the uh, status of your message and uh, results back to the uh, submitting guy some another way, maybe through signal R or maybe some some for polling mechanism. Um, yeah, that's that. And uh, the another thing I talk about this previously as well, the session affinity. So this is something uh, called. Uh, you can see this uh, affinity. You might have heard of this affinity cookie or sticky session or something like that. It's the same thing. So here take an example. Uh, you might see number of web servers. Uh, so it's the same instance of your web application and if you use the session state each of these so load balancer needs to know uh, if it serves by serve to a certain customer let's say for the guy x so it needs to know x uh, x request should route to the, this particular web server not to the other one so that means uh, it need to stick to one particular web server without uh, considering load of that server. Hundred of users may be using that, but he cannot route to another server because his uh, all the details stored in sort of a sticky session inside that web app. So uh, the best practice is uh, turn that off and uh, put the session out of the web app to a separate service like Cache Redis Cache, or maybe you can use the SQL Server. Mm, yep. I hope and uh, and the next thing is auto scaling. So many of the computing offerings uh, in the Asia offers auto scale. So the right amount of resources and uh, uh, services can be scaled out and uh, scaled down based on uh, the auto scaling. So uh, 
this is critical for both uh, service user experience and the cost savings and the service implementer because you need to balance that out so based on uh, auto scaling you can in of course uh, auto scale up to certain level where you throw big cash uh, around but uh, it might not uh, uh, might not uh, get uh, sort of uh, investment back even though you give some sort of extraordinary user experience so you need to balance it out so the way it works it always look at matrices collected from each apps and uh, for example cpu memory utilization and uh, number of requests per second so you can uh, create based on these uh, matrices you can create certain rules to auto scaling and um, yep so i'll show a couple of things if possible uh, after the uh, presentation if we have time so the next thing is background jobs so back at the day uh, sort of a hooking system together means b2b communications so maybe creating some scheduled jobs tasks file upload some long running processes that you might need to get rid of like a database cleaning indexes uh, rebuilding something like that so so all of these can be uh, put into a certain certain uh, asia apps like logic apps maybe asia function apps so that's easy to run and monitor separately. So there are possibility you can uh, create easily the logic app and uh, create certain uh, triggers and or maybe function app based on some HTTP triggers and uh, so on, maybe time triggers and do certain operations. Um, the next thing is uh, yeah, that's pretty much it about uh, the designing scalable Asia applications. So the next topic is about the capacity planning. So up until now, if you have any questions I can answer, mm -hmm. just bug me. So I'll uh, carry out the presentation. Um, the next thing is um, capacity planning. So when it comes to capacity planning it's it's certain things that uh, uh, you need to think of like uh, it's actually uh, what we call the uh, knowing the boundaries of resources and bit about uh, auto scaling so yeah uh, so use of content delivery networks uh, now you can actually use Azure Blob Storage to host a web app, maybe uh, create sort of a, a static content into the web app. So that that option is there. So you can put these things there and uh, expose it through a content delivery network. And of course, uh, web apps and publicly accessible web servers like some uh, static content and also the large scale event management which means uh, if you have any uh, idea about for example let's assume that you have you are building a sort of a uh, shopping cart or something like that and uh, when it comes to the new year season so maybe christmas season you might uh, expect certain spikes so how do you uh, manage that so you need to be aware of uh, certain spikes and uh, for example black friday marketing pushers something like that so you need to be aware of those things and uh, create certain rules or maybe uh, schedules based on that to scale you up and of course uh, choosing the right resources like i said there is no uh, one size uh, fits for all so there is no one database to fits for all or maybe one one particular uh, web app types even uh, in a single web app there are multiple uh, types of uh, uh, we call it uh, service plans 
uh, it might be compute optimized or it might be uh, something else memory optimized so it based on your requirement so if you have certain scientific calculations to do you should pick one of the d series uh, uh, service plan so it might be compute optimized if you have things to do in memory lots of things uh, some string operations something like that so you should uh, select sort of a memory optimized one so that that makes uh, that matters a lot choosing the right resources and um, of course choosing the matrices for scaling policies so uh, auto scaling rules that the detection mechanism based on measured triggers attribute like cpu q length and aggregated results like uh, like i explained like i showed the query times and things like that you can uh, make certain policies and uh, once that policy comes to certain threshold will automatically do something uh, like scaling out or scaling in maybe and also preemptively scan scaling based on trades so based on the trade trends you found out you might need to uh, add certain uh, schedules and do sort of uh, changes to your scaling plan um yep and of course the load testing so this is something uh, we forget about sometimes because um, it, it sometimes it might not uh, handy to do a load test uh, from our own desktop but uh, you need to create a professional sort of a load testing like integrate it to some form of a jmeter file and put it into a sort of a build pipeline and then execute it there so the main thing is uh, uh, we should know uh, the peak load of our application so we need to ensure that no nothing breaks when our application is under its full load and also uh, we need to aware of the azure service limits and uh, our application place within the limits perfectly so we need to understand these things so and also um, uh, the application behavior under load so we can assume that uh, we create certain uh, scale uh, roles, but you need to test it out with proper load testing and see how it uh, spans across when the load uh, increases. Um, and also measuring typical loads and uh, you need to uh, monitor your traffic to your application and understand user behavior. For example, if you have a certain APIs export, exposed, you need to be aware of uh, how many requests per second you are getting or maybe requests per minute, but um, the peak times of peak times and uh, uh, the loads and uh, like uh, what are the uh, tenants that has most data? What has what are the tenants that has some less number of data? Something like that. You need to be aware. Um, and of course, uh, the monitoring for scalability. So, like I said, uh, the monitoring enables us to uh, get this uh, sort of aspects. Uh, here I uh, posted two uh, things in from our databases. So the first one is showing the DTU percentage over the time and uh, the IO percentage over the time in the red bar. So and actually uh, these two shows the requests. Uh, I guess it's request per minute like gra graph. So that's not much and of course the response time so uh, these logs and matrices uh, you can easily found on asia monitor so and uh, asia application insights so this this looking at this would allow us to uh, scale up out in and out down manually or plan as a planned activity 
so monitoring is important and yeah some of the reasons setting up auto scaling and the goals of auto scaling so why why we need to uh, set up sort of as auto scaling so are the system able to handle the current number of requests uh, are we are we meeting our nfr nfrs like someone might say we need to download the home page during this much of seconds are we doing that are the system out of resources what's if, if i ask the question right now do your applications production environment uh, doing good right now of course this might be uh, monitored by sort of a SaaS operations team but you need to be aware as well uh, if it comes to your play so at least uh, think about uh, test environment or maybe dev environment is there an opportunity to have cost saving by not over provisioning resources because uh, sometimes we might uh, tend to pick the resources based on our guesswork for example last time we created a couple of web resources uh, like databases in uh, a sixth year as i remember sorry in uh, yeah sixth year so later found out that uh, even though we created it like that we can uh, decrease it to certain levels like s3 or maybe even further down because it it does not affect that much uh, dtus so you need to be aware of this so it should be you should be uh, thinking of creating sort of auto scaling and what are the goals like scale up down and uh, based on current demand and decrease the cost of course so improve the customer experience uh, by offering uninterrupted services as well as managing your cost so you have the option to <coughs> uh, do certain things based on auto scaling um <coughs> yep so that's pretty much it uh, when it comes to the application design. So we have a some form of a performance efficiency checklist. Uh, I guess we have been through most of things like application design. Uh, you need to design for scaling and of course the partition workload. Like I explained, you need to properly deviate from background jobs uh, and uh, the other scheduling operations, uh, some other scientific calculation, push it to somewhere else and uh, do the business logic in one layer, things like that. You need to partition the workloads as it uh, says and uh, scale as you need something like, um, for example, uh, if you, you, you should know if you are adding one instance to your to you, uh, if you are increasing uh, the number of instance by one in your web app, you should know uh, uh, what is the database, uh, what 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 is the effect of uh, increasing the database as well. Which means you need to increase the number of uh, maybe uh, DTUs or maybe double the size of database, so maybe create another database, something like that. So you need to. Uh, tag it as one unit and uh, of course av avoid client affinity i uh, hope you remember the affinity cookie so better if you can get rid of it that will enables you to scale it massively and take advantage of auto scaling features offload cpu intensive task to background tasks um yeah uh, so this is sort of a checklist that we need to go through mm, any questions up to now so before we move on to the case study quickly anyone having any thoughts so maybe questions Okay, I hope we are good. 
so i'll jump into the case study then um i think this is the case study uh, so we'll we'll quickly run through the success learning institute wants to have an e learning system so uh, i highlighted couple of words so they need to connect their lectures and students so as the initial step means they might have some uh, some other things in mind later increase this into mobile or maybe something like that and uh, also they want to download study materials which means they will be having sort of upload past papers tutorials probably videos some gigabytes of videos maybe and it has to be you know uh, this comes as typical uh, customer requirement it has to be latest cost efficient and simple and also uh, it needs to be highly available very limited time they have and competitive market okay everything is there so um, and we have given that uh, asia is the platform as a provider and they have about uh, 5000 of its student base for let's assume that maybe 200 lectures may be there so we are talking about uh, somewhere like 500 5500 of user base in total maybe so um i have put my thoughts in together but uh, this might not be the case uh, i have seen uh, the other speakers put their thoughts as well so the connections between these web apps might not be the exact same way but uh, of course you can uh, argue and uh, distinguish between several architecture layouts and of course you can uh, select what best for your application so um, since we have some keywords like latest cost efficient simple highly available so i have put uh, something uh, in together so first i'll explain with the web app so i have stated three web apps but it might not be the case we can omit uh, these two and increase the number of instances inside this web app so that's up to you to decide so i have thought of like uh, creating these three in separate three regions to reach the student base because i thought that uh, this 5000 user base uh, might be scattered around the world so we can uh, distribute the databases as well if required and we have a traffic manager profile in uh, front so it will decide where to go based on uh, we can select of course the algorithm uh, either it can be based on the geography or maybe priority or maybe some other algorithms or maybe it might be custom and uh, we have put a cdn where we host our somewhere in the blob storage or some static content we host uh, our web app and push it through the cdn to outside world and of course uh, i have added two asia functions for separately upload and download so you can uh, go to sort of http link can easily upload uh, and sort of a huge file without eating up uh, these web app resources so it will goes to asia blob storage in terms of persistent layer i have selected uh, blob storage account as well as the cosmos db as the primary storage because i might not uh, think of an rdbms because Uh, we don't have much of a relations to manage like in complex business application so it might be mostly dealing with uh, courses materials and lectures and students relationship so i think it's good to go with highly available cosmos db as a sort of a document db and of course i have put a sort of a service bus where we have a message queue Uh, for example assume that uh, since they mentioned they have 5000 number of students assume that uh, one lecturer going to take place an assignment online assignment with 200 students so uh, if they are given 20 minutes time to complete the assignment with some uh, multiple choice questions they will be clicking here and there so you will get burst of requests 
to an endpoint. So I thought of having a function app there so you can uh, in scale this based on certain uh, parameters and put the responses into a sort of certain sort of a queue and uh, then process it through another function app which is uh, which i didn't show up here so push it to a certain uh, persistent layer and of course we have a redis cache so between the database and the uh, application layer and of course the Azure key vault to keep the secrets and manage identity to uh, not to share uh, Azure Key Vault secret uh, and app keys, so you can use managed identity to, to communicate between these web apps and Key Vault, and vice versa. And of course, we have application monitoring to monitor the logs and stuff. So that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm.